thank you all for continuing. And um, we'll just start with a little warm up as we usually do. So get your pencils and pads and take a deep breath. This will take a minute or so to settle in. And we're taking our note of our position, our boss position, how we're sitting, our posture. I'm gonna straighten my chair. There we go. A little more upright. Yeah, how's our back position, our hips and shoulders. We're feeling the weight of ourselves on the chair. Feel the weight of our feet touching the ground. Another deep breath. Notice where our shoulders, elbows, and wrists are lined up or not. Are our elbows resting? Are they in the air? Are our wrists resting on the table? Are we resting on the side of our hand or is our hand elevated? There in our hand is our pencil. And uh, how are we gripping that? Is it in our left or right hand? Are we holding it loosely, tightly, with fingers turned like we do when we're writing or turned to the side, held toward the tip or down toward the end. And then we bring it down and touch to the paper. We notice the contact, the pressure that we apply, tightness of our grip. the feel of the pencil point as it moves across the paper. Is it sliding? Is it bumping? What speed are we going? Putting all our attention on that pencil point now. And the peripheral awareness, just noticing all those things that come up. Noticing whatever comes up and just letting it pass. Not judging it. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hi, we're doing a short meditation now. So yeah, get your pencil and your paper. Okay, you got your attention on the pencil point that's moving. You're watching whatever comes out with some sort of fascination. Hopefully some joy. Hopefully some wonderment, some surprise maybe. What are we so, doing? I'm sorry. Oh, we're just doing a warm up drawing. Oh, okay. A little bit of guided drawing. Um, is that a continuous from the last week drawing project or is a new one? Uh, yeah, it's just a warm up. It's just kind of make mark making. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so we're just making marks and putting our attention right on the pencil point. Paying attention to our position of our body, our arms, how they're supported our hand, how it's supported, how we're holding the pencil, the grip and the pressure we're applying, feel the feel of the pencil moving on the paper. And then we're just moving. We can make single marks. You can leave the pencil down and make continuous marks, whatever feels fun, whatever feels right. We get to talk about that a little today. 
letting whatever come out comes out come out yeah certainly it, having no judgment about it hopefully amused by it this is just drawing to feel the drawing so yeah while we have our attention on the point of the pencil watching that pencil i want to I want to engage your imagination a little bit. I want you to think about in your, in your imagination as the pencil is moving. I want to go back to like very early ancestors. Very early, early human beings on the planet. Someone maybe with a stick or a piece of clay. Maybe someone making a pot or a hand tool, using primitive tools to create. So as you're drawing along, imagine, yeah, you're fascinated seeing this maybe for the first time in human history, someone is actually paying attention to marks that are being made. You try to feel the, that feeling, that sort of very early feeling of man manipulating materials. that first kind of awareness dawning that here you are in this world of things and there's a hand that maybe you can somehow control and it's making these things that are appearing in front of you you get that first feedback that first aesthetic uplift that first little joy huh That first resonance that something could be more than the sum of its parts. That you could start with something like a lump of clay or a, or a stick or a stone and it could go from being something that you found, something generic, something like a blank piece of paper and a pencil into something that resonated more in your mind. before you had ever seen anything called art or ever seen anything called decorative or seen anything called a tool, it occurs to you. There's something very similar in the way we think. So we end up, uh, this, uh, everybody can keep drawing, keep making marks. If you feel warmed up and you wanna work on something else, that's good. You can start with a new sheet. If you wanna continue just mark making and paying attention to the pencil, that's also quite good. You can go on for as long as you like. And uh, you can just listen to what I have to say. Uh, there's one exercise. I don't have as many exercises uh, tonight as I'd like. Uh, there's a, a little bit more material, but um, I think what will happen is what happened at the beginning of the class when we started. Uh, so there's kind of one week where I give more, a little more information and one week where there's a more practice. So we'll do a little more information and a little more practice next week. I have some good exercises when we get to the, the next section, but there's a, I'm working with Christopher Alexander and his books and 
I, I, I did a lot of reading this week. Thank you for that. I really enjoyed myself getting to know the information even better. So, um, yeah, it needs to be a little more introduction so you know what's going on, but I'll, I'll get into it. Yeah, I just want to finish up with uh, uh, after um, all the reading of the drawings. And last week we went through ox herding pictures and I heard some great responses. People wrote me really great things and told me great things about their experiences. A lot of people knew about the ox drawings and liked hearing them in a different light. So that was really fun for me to do. And the only thing uh, that ends up in the book uh, at the very end uh, is a uh, discussion about community and how important it is to to read your work and show your work, even if you show your work to yourself. And uh, you'll see that tonight in Chris Alexander's thinking that uh, to build up uh, a knowledge of what's persistent in your work and what your tendencies are and the kind of marks that you make and to be able to get familiar with those and then understand uh, the feedback you're getting from those and then decode in some way, those tendencies, it takes time. Not that we're in a hurry, <laughs> but it takes time. And uh, one great way to do that is to see the work. So yeah, displaying your work somehow uh, in your house or your on your desk so you can see it uh, is a great way to get familiar with it. Sometimes there's a drawing that just hangs around on my desk or near me that I like, but, oh, well, it's not good enough to be professional work, but it's not going to go on the iClock site, so it just hangs around. And then I find out, yeah, I have real fondness for that work, and then I sort of figure out why. Sometimes that work that's not, quote, unquote, really great, <laughs> it has a mark. It has a, it has a line in there, just I made in the kind of flow of attention that, uh, that really gives me great feedback. So I can't say enough for showing your work first to yourself uh, and secondly uh, showing it to another person and uh, I, I won't go on but I have a lot to say about uh, how showing it to someone else changes the work and changes your relationship to the work. Uh, when I uh, have work ready for a show and my dealer comes to the studio to see it, it somehow, it just kind of ends the work, <laughs> kind of close. Once it's been seen in some cases, yeah, that it's, it's in uh, more of a group mind, public mind, what the work is, and it kind of, kind of solidifies it in a way that it can stifle things. So I have to be careful not to show things that I'm not ready to show. But on the other hand, it kind of moves me past things. I don't tend to linger and I can consider things finished in a way if I can't consider them finished on my own. So Showing work is good in that case. And also, uh, I, I see something persistent in the work or I see something that's important in the work because of the way I'm thinking about it. But someone else sees something different. And so hearing from another person sometimes can clue me into something obvious or something strong in the work that I hadn't noticed. And I have a couple of very good friends who look at my work and I've known for a number of years. And that's a great way to work. And the, the, the third level is sharing sort of openly to everybody. That's like posting it in the Facebook group. And that takes a different kind of uh, courage, <laughs> different kind of openness, different kind of vulnerability. Uh, but it can work well for a lot of reasons. And a number of you do, and I do appreciate it. And I think it's a great thing for the group to have activity online just for ourselves. I put up stuff all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to show work. That's sort of in my nature, but I think that we, if we see a variety of work, it's good for so many reasons. We see what other people are working with, their triumphs, what they struggle with. We see our own mind, how we critique and support those different works and how we judge and <laughs> judge our own selves in that. That's a good place for self-observation. So that's really good. Yeah, and it lets us all know that we're all kind of working, working toward the same thing. So the subjects we're moving into are, um, yeah, they're, they're connected more deeply to the way we think about work and the way we think about ourselves. They're where meditation will kind of lead us. So we're going to work a little more collaboratively here in the class uh, and hopefully share more 
but also I wanna encourage you to ask more questions and to, let's try to develop a little more discussion in class as we go. So again, be open. I'll go into some topics which uh, maybe I don't present all that well, <laughs> or I don't present that clearly, but maybe they're also very complicated. So it helps me to understand where you don't understand. So please be open about that. Yeah, so the training wheels in some ways come off uh, because we're, we, we learned about uh, meditation practices and hopefully with all the um, concentration practices, you found one, you found a way of working that you like. Um, if, you, if not, I can still help with that. And this, if you're trying a bunch, that might be the way. You can always try a bunch. But if you have a practice that's good, uh, that practice is now going to really be a tool as we work, that there's going to be some stability in that practice. So you may need to fall back on that. And that's one reason we do the drawing your own path and all that. Well, I wanted to do drawing your own path before I got into um, other subjects because the utility of being able to sit and draw and focus your attention and get into flow and get into that access concentration, that's really useful. So if anything gets unsettling or uh, some things come up that you're unsettled about, yeah, so drop back to simple concentration practices or consult someone in the group in one of the meetings or ask me or just stop and have a break. Yeah, so if things feel tight, just as a little, a little safety message there. So we're gonna go uh, further into uh, Vipassana, into insight practices. Our first one that we worked with was the reading of the drawings. And the, uh, the tradition is that we get our concentration up, which is kind of why we start with the focus exercise. But just in general, we like to learn concentration first, because again, that's like the muscle that pedals the bike and gives us stability. We build up that muscle a little bit. And then we start dropping in the questions and the insights. So yeah, the uh, what's called the 15 uh, properties, which is uh, something that Christopher Alexander came up with, will become our inquiry. So we're going to have a series of inquiry meditations uh, in the next uh, few weeks, looking at uh, his universal properties for, for design. So I've talked about Paul Clay before, and I probably should talk about him more, but I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to him. But uh, the things I've said before, especially in the conceptual art discussions, were about how he tried to invent a set of rules for drawing. <laughs> he, he was a Bauhaus artist and uh, sort of maybe a stereotype of the Bauhaus that he wanted to make these rules. He wanted to have rule number one for drawing and rule number two. And uh, as I said, he came up with a set of uh, uh, guidelines for making drawings, a sort of universal set of principles that later uh, in retrospect look a lot like what Paul Clay thought drawing was, uh, uh, you know, almost a hundred years later. Uh, so after I saw some of the limits uh, with Paul Clay's work, and he does, he does a lot to describe the two-dimensional design and make sort of some generalizations and universal rules for two-dimensional design. But um, he, doesn't, he doesn't often get outside of discussions of design. So after I worked with Paul Clay for a number of years, I was still looking around because I still wanted to write uh, universal uh, artificial intelligence to do creative work. I was still looking for, for systems that uh, could find a more universal set of rules, could find uh, something uh, something better. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way to say it. But anyway, I came across Christopher Alexander, uh, and he'd been around for quite a while, and, uh, and he is very widely, widely known. One of the great things about his work is that the people that uh, know him uh, really love what he does, uh, and he's uh, had influence in a number of fields, which is really interesting. And so part of the reason his universal system is more successful is that he crosses a lot of field boundaries. So he was born in 1936. Oh, and I, I should say, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not, tout, I'm not going to be touting his system as, uh, you know, the end all be all. <laughs> this is not like a teaching of uh, Christopher Alexander. I hope we'll be just as critical of his work as we, as we are about practicing it and understanding what 
how we can use it. Uh, so I'll try to put some perspective on his work at the same time. But anyway, he was born in 1936. So he came, yeah, Clay was active in the 20s. So he was sort of the next generation, maybe two generations past Paul Clay. Uh, uh, he was born in Vienna, Austria. So yeah, a child like during Second World War, uh, he has this kind of similar Austrian uh, German attitude about, about rule sets and order. Uh, he worked primarily as an architect. Uh, and he was schooled in England. He had a great career. He went to uh, Harvard uh, and MIT for his uh, graduate work. And he ended up as a professor of architecture uh, at Berkeley, where he was for about 40 years. Uh, and so he had a lot of influence in the Bay Area. He was a pretty strict uh, Catholic. Uh, in his upbringing, but when he got out to California, he uh, brought now to thinking a little bit more. Uh, and so he uh, had some uh, dabbling in Zen. Uh, there's a nice article, which I'll give you to, to read next week. I'll give you the links for in Tricycle Magazine. So there are some crossover uh, into Buddhism, but for the most part, he tried to remain uh, scientific or objective. His, his goal was really to be objective, like an objective way to to evaluate design. Uh, and he, he influenced what's known as design science. That was really what he wanted, design science. That was kind of one of his goals. So in 1963, uh, he, he published a book called Notes on the Synthesis of Form, which is a great title. I thought, as soon as I saw Notes on the Synthesis of Form, I thought, here's the next uh, rule set that could possibly work for me uh, because uh, yeah 1963 was is this the beginning of computers and so he was giving uh, he was giving step-by-step -step instructions I thought when I first got into the book about how a form arises but the d difference was that um, Christopher Alexander uh, does not ignore the mind <laughs> does not ignore the fact that we're, we're people and that um, the designs that we make go go to people, so that was also really attractive uh, thing. Gr growing up, uh, being born in 1936, and then growing up and doing his architecture uh, through the early 1960s, so he saw a brutalist architecture come through, and he saw all of the modernist glass box architecture come up. Those would be like these great big office towers that are just look like they're covered with mirrors or just covered with glass, kind of. Uh, straight uh, boxes going up. You've seen them, of course, these glass towers. And um, he was not kind in his critique of these. He was, he didn't like these. And he thought for the most part, they were pretty lifeless. And he was really a first principles guy. He wanted to go back to those, uh, really the beginnings of building. And so, uh, in uh, 1977, uh, he published a book called A Pattern Language, and two years later, sort of the companion piece called A Timeless Way of Building. So if you think about now, all the emphasis on sustainability, here was Christopher Alexander in 1979, uh, writing a book called The Timeless Way of Building. And he wanted to go back and see how people built things from the beginning, how they thought about building, them and why things had the shapes that they did. And the pattern language uh, was a fascinating book because he wanted to break down structures. Now he's an architect and kind of an urban designer. So he wanted to break down structures into um, like the windows, the doorways, the doorway would be a pattern, the window would be a pattern in this pattern language. An intersection of two roads would be a pattern. You know, the way one building joined to another building would be a pattern. So almost anything that you can think of, the staircase in front of a house, the way a fence looks, these are all patterns in this pattern language. And he shows a lot of examples in this book of pattern language of, of uh, villages and cities that built up uh, without a plan. They built up in a kind of an organic way. And he looks at those patterns and he tries to see why things fit together. But he also looks at the quality 
of the place. And this may be, this is the beginning of where it starts to get more universal, is that he's very sensitive to the living quality of where he is. So he, he'll, he'll visit a place and it'll seem, you know, cold and sterile. It'll be a lobby of an office building. And he'll think, why, what is the pattern here? And why does it look that way? And then he'll visit uh, uh, a temple in Kyoto with the with the large wooden columns and uh, and the uh, fascinating joinery, and he'll think, well, how does this feel, and why does this feel more comfortable, or what kind of quality uh, uh, does this give? And he writes about this in the pattern language. And one of the interesting thing was that in breaking down uh, architecture and interior design in terms of these patterns was that he showed that uh, these could be as components and these components could be interchanged and they could be understood individually. And this caught hold, uh, because he was in Berkeley, it caught hold in a big way in Silicon Valley. And so there's a type of a programming language called object-oriented programming. And Christopher Alexander is giving a lot of credit uh, for influencing the design of those languages because uh, there are, uh, the, the inventors of those languages thought about components of software design as patterns. So for instance, every time you want to, uh, uh, every time you type out a letter and you want to keep that information, you choose a menu item, save the file. So that's, that's a pattern. File saving is a pattern. File closing is a pattern. File opening is a pattern. So all these things that you do uh, in programming uh, can be, uh, seen as separate design components, as patterns. And so uh, you'll, if you um, search Christopher Alexander, you might find a lot of literature that has nothing to do with architecture, has a lot to do with programming, and you'll know why. So not only uh, did he, was he influential uh, uh, in other fields, but he was, he was really on the outside of architecture because he wanted to build in ways that gave attention to the quality of being in the space more than the uh, economy or the sleekness or any fashion about the design. So uh, he stayed on the outside of architecture for quite a while. And he took on projects that he really wanted to spend a lot of time thinking about the design on. So, so he, did, he did a few projects, but in, incredibly detailed and incredibly well. Okay, so you can see that uh, after he had worked on patterns, he kept refining and distilling this idea and trying to get that quality, that, that, that sense of presence, that, that uh, peacefulness, those kinds of things that he would feel in places that he'd be attracted to in these architectural spaces. He kept trying to think of why those were there and how to distill them. And this puts him on the road to this kind of universal set of principles, uh, um, universal set of design. So uh, he goes from architectural spaces uh, into the nature of the self. He starts having to look at the person and he starts having to examine his own experience uh, to figure out why uh, these responses are coming along. This kind of in instinctual responses. And uh, one thing he says when he's given an award late in life and one thing he says is that, um, that despite um, all our differences uh, as individuals and despite all our differences in taste that there are some things that connect us there are some universal things that connect us and those were the things that he tried to pull out okay so he's so he's looking for uh ways of talking about that quality uh but he finds a teacher and that teacher turns out to be uh, uh carpets <laughs> woven carpets uh, and especially uh, carpets made uh, in central Turkey in the Anatolia region, in Western, what's now Western Turkey, uh, that are made in Sufi tradition. So it seems like an odd place to start. But in fact, let me find the exact dates of it. I'll show, I'm going to show you a couple of the book covers. I don't know if you, I don't think you have to buy these books because I'll try to give you as much information, but this book I'm pulling a lot from tonight, and it's called A Foreshadowing of 21st Century Art. It was published in 1993. And it's got this carpet on the front. And in fact, the, 
posting I put up today to advertise the class had a had a carpet picture. So, um, what is it about these carpets, and why is he attracted to them? Well, uh, in the 12th to the 16th century, which is which is the time period of his collection, carpet collection, uh, this was kind of a peak culture going on. You think about what's going on. The trade routes are just kind of coming online from Europe. Uh, this uh, area on the globe is situated amongst uh, uh, Asia. It's it's the far west Asia. Uh, it's just below Europe and it's just above Africa. So it's, it's, it's in a place where it's really a crossroads of all of the commerce of the time. So, so as cosmopolitan as it could possibly be. And uh, there's a large group of Sufis who are sort of a mystical branch of Islam. There may be other uh, examples of this kind of peak culture, devoted culture, but here's, here's a group of people who are, uh, who are really uh, looking into their work uh, as, a, as a reflection of their religion. Uh, you could think of uh, uh, Gothic cathedrals in Europe was a time when people were equating uh, craftsmanship and religion closely and also in the Tibetan Tonka painting. So there are other, some other examples, but this was, this was a, a long example and the carpets are amazing and magnificent. And I, I read this book for a number of years and I studied it and, uh, and I thought I'd gotten really plenty out of it uh, and understood a lot of Christopher Alexander's arguments. And then I went to the Philadelphia Museum and they had uh, some of these particular examples of these carpets uh, to see in person. And um, yeah, it was another humbling experience because uh, uh, I'll just say good art is art you have to stand in front of. And one thing about good art that you have to stand in front of uh, is its presence. And that's really what uh, Christopher Alexander was keying in on. And you can really understand it when you see the vibrancy of the colors of these carpets and the levels of details in these carpets. So I, I really understood why he was attracted to them. So. Yeah, we're moving into a realm that has to do with design, but it has a lot to do with what's going on inside. And we have to talk about what's going on inside. So kind of a spiritual connection. And how do we enter this realm of spirituality and art? This is, this is where Drawing on Path sort of begins, but it goes deeper and it's gone deeper for a long time. So let me share a screen because I have a quote. Da, da, da. Okay, I'll just share this. I'll also say, um, besides uh, teaching this on Thursday nights, uh, there's a there's a lecture series I'm going to. In it's about uh, uh, Buddhist visual literacy. This and so this quote actually came from that class. So I'm get, you're getting some some benefit of feet feet over. It says art enters the realm of the sacred when it transcends personal and cultural expressions and mirrors the deeper, deeper levels of our mind. So that's, yeah, that's really well put. This was published in 87, like way before I thought that this was really a thing. But again, I say it's gone on for a long time. And uh, it's from a book called The Art of Enlightenment, Art of Tibet. And uh, Tartang Tulku is the speaker of this. Uh, yeah, when we get past those things that we define our, uh, as ourself and even our culture and get uh, somewhat deeper, we're getting into the sacred. It says, art helps illuminate dimensions of consciousness inaccessible to our physical senses. It can awaken our most subtle perceptions and show us the true nature of our being. What's the, to the point of it there. So... Gone, gone through and learned how to use our drawing, focus on our drawing, and then start to feed back on our drawing, we can hopefully approach some of these levels. Uh, and um, we're going to use uh, his work in his bigger work to guide us a little bit. That's gonna be, that's gonna be our map for now.
So I'm starting with the foreshad foreshadowing of 21st century art because it's a it's a more of a specific example I'm talking about the larger work. Uh, let me stop the sharing. Yeah, so this book, I'll show you, that's the cover. I know it's, why well, show the cover, but there it is. It's called The Nature of Order. So this was published, I think, 2001. I think the car carpet book came out in 99, no, well, maybe 92, and this came out in 99. They're about six years apart. And in the carpet book, he already refers to The Nature of Order. Well, it turned out that The Nature of Order, the book, single book he was talking about in the carpet book, is four volumes. So it's a, quite a big thing. And there's a lot, <laughs> I'll but I'll give you an idea of it. Um, so the first book of it is called The Phenomenon of Life. And we'll talk a little bit about the phenomenon of life uh, to start with, and then we'll get more into it and how he defines life. But when he says the phenomenon of life, what he's talking about there is that sense of presence, like that living quality. And it's fun that the way he sort of judges a work of art, which is, a, which is very different than maybe we're taught in art school or maybe when we go to a museum and we don't know much about it and we, or we're, we see the Sotheby's auction last Monday when they raised 470 something million dollars for paying, you know, this is not what he's talking about. <laughs> he's talking about this living quality like what makes a work of art demand presence or give presence when you're with it? What is it, that quality in that object that we relate to? Uh, and, and he does a good job of, of teasing that out and talking about it. And it's not uninvolved with our own. We say, well, it's just, it's just our own projection on the thing, which, is, which, is, which does have some validity, but not entirely. And that's the interesting part, how the object itself has some life and uh, indeed, everything is uh, impermanent and moving. And, and so it, it works into eventually uh, Buddhist concepts. There is underlying it. We can tease out some concepts that we're used to from uh, Buddhism and meditation. But uh, he gets to, through his own, you know, uh, his own Catholicism and his own path that way. Okay, so, uh, and in book one, in The Phenomenon Life, he does present uh, the 15, what he calls the 15 fundamental properties and th these are the properties that, in, when combined in different ways, give more and less life to something. And we'll go through them all, although we, we won't do it tonight, but we'll go through them all, the 15 fundamental properties. And a lot of our drawing exercises will come from the 15, practicing the 15 fundamental properties and how to combine them. And this, it's, it's really a lot of fun. I've spent a lot of time <laughs> since I learned about them, maybe. I, I never left the 15 fundamental properties. It's a really good set. And it, I love Paul Clay and he makes some incredible points about the work and they're different than the 15 fundamental properties, but these are very, very uh, good set. Okay, so in book two, uh, after he's established these properties and how they fit together and how they create life in an object, uh, book two is called the process of creating life. So if book one is the noun of the properties, the identifying and naming the properties. Book two is the verb. It's how the properties move in time, how they're created, how they dissolve. Yeah, Terry likes that idea. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you start to think, wow, okay, they, how, how does the property come into being in the object and how does it leave in the object and how does it change as it stays in the object? So. Yeah, the, some of the properties in motion. Uh, book three is a lot of examples because he's done so much architectural work. And so we will do some of that, but uh, he gives, and, the, and they're, it's useful to see it applied. So book one and two are applied into, in book three. And so you see, it's called a vision of the living world. And he talks about his own work in the world and how he's tried to use these properties and how, and how it's worked and not worked uh, and what the limits of some of that are. And we'll be able to judge it as well. Uh, and then book four is called The Luminous Ground. Uh, and he said, towards a new conception of the nature of matter. So he got, kind of goes really far in book four. So that's in the future. But, uh, and that's, that's sort of the, his last sort of summary of this topic. And this topic is not really written about much because it's pretty vast. Uh, it requires practice. And I think that if you're not practicing either architecture in this way or practicing drawing or something in this way, that uh, it's hard to get some of the stuff. It took me a long time to really figure out that what he said 
what, what that I thought what he said was working or how, how I learned to believe in it by my own examples or how it functioned for me. So you don't see it written about a lot like that. When you do see it written about, it's often just descriptive. Uh, but uh, again, in the spirit of uh, collaboration here, uh, if anybody's searching around for these ideas and researching or looking up Christopher Alexander and comes across more, I'm, I'm happy to find more information. There's an institute that was started in Italy uh, for building, uh, but it, it's mostly an architectural thing. Uh, and it's mostly focused on uh, applied work, but there is some, a little bit of discussion, but nobody quite goes into it in the, to the level of mindfulness and theory. So hopefully as a group, uh, if, if people are interested and I'm certainly want to, want to do it, we can get a little bit deeper into his work and really start to see the connections. And I'll point out a couple uh, tonight, uh, the connections of his work and the kind of mindfulness work that we've done. And it's interesting through time, you do find people that get so deep into a subject, like through the philosophy of the subject, and they really get into the sort of spiritual nature of the subject, and he, he does. And his work after The Nature of Order, uh, he did a big project in Japan where he applied a lot of it, and so you see his most recent work uh, was this uh, project. And then uh, lately, although he's probably, I think he's 85 or 86 now, um, He's been interested in sustainability, which is that timeless way of building idea, which thank goodness he's doing some work on that. So, but I have, we haven't seen a publication yet about it. So, okay. Yeah, could interview him for the podcast. Yeah, I've, tr I've tried to contact him, but it's uh, either he's, either he's not, doesn't want to do it or I don't know what, maybe he's... <laughs> but it hasn't been available, but I've tried. But if anyone can find contacts to, to his people, that I would be, I'd love to interview him for sure. I think he'd have a lot to say to us, but uh, the times I've seen him, uh, people push him a little bit on the spiritual side. He, he, he's not, he talks about it, but he really wants to talk about it in a scientific way and he really wants to stick to facts. So he doesn't get very esoteric, but we'll, we'll anyway. Okay. So when he talks about the carpets, he says this carpet is a picture of God. Yep. Where is he? Where is he now? He is in England. He lives in England. Uh, it's been retired since uh, 2002, I think, from Berkeley. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and he uses the word God. I don't want to scare anyone. I don't know It's if anyone has... <laughs> feelings more it can be alarming to use the word but but we'll we'll use it in a broad sense and in fact he does use it in a broad sense but he I say he was raised catholic so that point's important and he and he um he uses the word uh so and he says the carpet and it was to the sufis who made it the carpet was a picture of god but it's also like a picture of the of oneness of the world or like i say the source of creativity the car the carpet is a picture of the source of creativity in the same way that our drawings are pictures of our own source of creativity. Like we know we can't make marks on the page that don't reflect us in some way. They reflect the pencil we chose, they reflect the paper we chose, they reflect all of those things that we, when we turn the light around in our meditation to try and look at that source, the things that come out, the way we express all of our, our uh, history, all of our emotional history, all that build up, get how all that gets expressed in our drawing. Like no drawing, I would say every drawing is a self-portrait in some way. And if we looked at all our drawings, even if we chose to draw the same thing, they would all reflect us in this way that it's, it's a picture of us. It's a mirror. And, and he said, the carpet is a picture of God. And he said, it's very important that that's an essential fact to the people that made them. And that's an important thing because when we start to line up this looking at the source and this expressing of the source with what we're making, uh, yeah, we start to get a little of this luminance. We start to get a little of this resonance. So we had a, a, in the second class, I talked about what it takes to make a good drawing. And I sort of said that the answers in the question there. When we think back about what makes a good drawing, we're starting to connect with that energy, with that creative energy. So this artistic tradition, like I said, it's in central Anatolia as early as 5,000 BC. 
goes way back. Not the carpets he, he has, but there are historic artifacts that show back as far as about 5,000 BC, they were, they were basically pictures of God. Some, this energy we're reaching when we make a good drawing, this sense of completeness. It says, in carpets made by the Sufis, the feeling of the being nature, the feeling of consciousness that exists in all things, this, this feeling of cre creativity exists side by side uh, uh, yeah, with this picture of God. So this is almost like that Nama Rupa, like the carpet and, the, and God kind of exist and are coming out at the same time because the person making it is kind of in this state of gazing on the source and at the same time, they're letting that control and filter their channel. Like we said, the same way the brain uh, divides uh, uh, activity, compartmentalizes activity, and they sort of coordinate, this is what's going on. What is Namaruta, John? Uh, okay, that'll take me a little bit to go into. <laughs> let me, no. let me, I, I have discussed it, but let me pass on that for the moment if I can. Yeah, no problem. Okay. But it's literally name and form. It, it's a it's a it's a way in a Buddhist thinking of talking about the uh, matter and spirit and how they go together. So so the, what's happening in these Sufi carpets is this matter, the the material of the carpet and the spirit, this kind of de devoted mystical religious tradition, trying to use this as a way of meditating, using this as a way of cr creating this image of, of showing devotion uh, in, this, in this weaving process yeah, is going on at the same time. And so uh, you could say the two ideas, the two things that are trying to accomplish are interwoven, okay? Which makes the carpet as a medium so perfect, right? So it's so rare that you find a choice of medium that so ideally reflects the uh, movement of the creative energy that's going on. So there's this movement of, of creative energy uh, uh, to express an image and, and it's, it's, they're interlocked, they're interwoven. So the carpet's being woven. <laughs> These two things exist together and they reflect each other in the actual substance of the carpet. So uh, uh, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of energy already in this idea. And of course, they, they, to become a master carpet maker, according to the research of Christopher Alexander in that area, it takes about seven years. Uh, and then to become a master colorist, once you're a, a master carpet maker, to, to go on and become a master colorist, uh, as it says in his book, it takes another seven years, and the graduation of becoming a master colorist is to mix a color with dyes that no one's ever seen before. That's how in control of the colors you are. And he says, okay, so it takes about six or seven years of medical school and training to become a brain surgeon, and it takes that long, you know, to get a PhD in something else or, or to become a, a, a physicist. So he's saying it's like getting two PhDs for the people who were at the at the peak of this uh, culture, putting these rugs together. They've studied it for a long time and have a devotion to it for a long time. So there's, there's, there's a great uh, mastery amongst these uh, carpet makers. So our uh, first task is to understand how this resonant energy, this God stuff is produced by the color and geometry. How do we, what are we looking for when we look at the carpets and how do we know uh, when we've seen it? <laughs> and how is it that just uh, particular colors next to particular colors and the lines in particular orders make this? So, and he does go into this and he calls it uh, what we're looking for, wholeness. And, and the goal of the pra practice of looking at the carpets is called objective wholeness. We want to find a way to measure this degree of wholeness uh, without uh, preference or taste. So we want to find a way to eliminate uh, like and dislike or uh, flashiness or attractiveness. We, we need a, he's a, he's a scientist at heart in this way. He wants an objective way to measure this wholeness. And to do so, he feels like we have to uh, appeal to a more basal understanding, a more instinctual response, a, a kind of a mindful approach to remove the story and the culture turns very introspective 
And it really relies on the similarity of us as humans to exceed our differences and sort of at the gut level be in some ways the same or to discover by these experiments in what ways at a gut level we're the same. Uh, he points out that learning to see this wholeness takes time. Uh, part of it is dealing with the story and getting rid of the ex uh, story and building up experience, but uh, we, fund uh, we have to fundamentally discover at some point what it is we're looking for. So we have to experience it. So, but people, uh, I've talked to people and there's a lot of experience in this group uh, that I've heard, uh, but everyone almost has a story where uh, they uh, have this relationship to art. They get see a work of art and it blows their mind for the first time or they have a very emotionally moving experience seeing a work of art. So that, that's a taste of it. That's a taste of it. That kind of uh, real engagement with the work. Uh, we start to become more sensitive to what created that feeling in us and we, and we start to try to look for it and distinguish it. Okay, so let's look at two carpets. Oh man, this is going on and on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Can people see those? Maybe when I move that. So on the left uh, is uh, what he says is a very well-known carpet. It's called the Berlin Prayer Rug. It's from the second century, central Anatolia. It's not in his collection. It's in a collection in a museum in Berlin, uh, which is why it's called the Berlin Prayer Rug. Uh, and the one on the right uh, is from the Caucasus, Caucasus mid 19th century. It's called the Kazakh Star. So if we put these two carpets side by side, and we ask the question, which has more wholeness? Right? Which has more of this quality that we're looking for? If I ask you that, they'll pr I'll probably get a divided field because uh, most people will answer when they look at them with what they prefer. That's normal. And one main reason for that is that we don't have a good idea yet of what this quality of wholeness is. We haven't cultivated it and we don't have black so we will immediately sort of just say which one we like better. So how do we construct a question that is concrete but pushes us out of the ordinary and points us uh, to a different response? How do we ask it so that we, we uh, point to the right answer? Point to the quality of wholeness. Okay, so here's the question. There we go. I can't quite see everybody. You know what I'll ask you. Okay, so here is the question that uh, that Christopher Alexander asks. I'm going to read the whole thing. And so think about the question as you sort of look at these two carpets and see uh, where your you know attention goes. Okay, if you had to choose one of these two carpets as a picture of your own self, a picture of your true nature, which would you choose? Another way to say it is to choose, choose which one seems better able to represent your whole being, the essence of yourself, good and bad, all that is human in you. Think for a minute. Focus on the real oneness of you and compare that thing with your impression of the carpet. Choose the carpet that seems more like me, more like that good drawing, more resonant. Which is the truer picture of yourself? Do you have to make one, choose one? Okay. You have to choose one. So one on the left. left. Okay, Lauren says the left. How many say the one on the left? Definitely the one on the left. Yeah. No anybody, anybody on the right? <laughs> okay. You, you, all, you all get an A. Sorry. I could see myself uh, for the right one in, in the future, but not now. 
Okay, that's good. The, the orange and black one is the one that Chris Alexander says has uh, has more wholeness to it. And so- oh, It has more wholeness. The orange and black? The orange and black one. Oh, okay. The one on the- Why? The, the less orderly one. Yes. Okay. Is that it? This- That's the one that I chose. Not, this not one. the one with all the blues. There are no yes. right or wrong answers. Oh, my Lord. Oh. Right. <laughs> It's must have been before they invented numbers, so you could they say have to agree with two. I need to put I need to put numbers under this. This was yeah, uh, yeah it was a little mm -hmm. okay. So uh, com coming up, uh, a lot of these anyway. We're going to talk about them, but this is the how it begins. We select them and we talk about the qualities, and when we get into the the properties, uh, the we'll talk about centers next because centers are the key to wholeness. And then we'll talk about fundamental properties. And so we'll add to our experience is and what we're looking for. And uh, you'll see that your perception of the carpets will shift. I did. My experience in, in understanding what it was looking at. Uh, but it's the uh, same way I uh, took art history was that uh, I had a certain uh, taste, certain uh, taste for art, certain way. And then uh, as I learned more, uh, yeah, that changed. Okay. But um, yeah, so Chris Alexander's saying uh, that the that the uh, one on the well, the the one with more dark area, I'd say, is the one with more wholeness. But uh, no problem Why? if you didn't feel that way. Why? Why yes, is that's the next. One has more wholeness? Yes, that's what we'll get into. We're gonna we're gonna explore oh. that in depth. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to that answer. But w one way of saying it is that there are more centers but I haven't explained what centers are yet. And the other is that it contains uh, more of the 15 properties, but we need to learn, we need to build up a sensitivity to seeing it uh, too. So, uh, and, and, and by his own account, it takes time. John, I'm just a little confused. Okay. Which carpet is the one that he says has more wholeness? Was it the one that's like, it looks red and black? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up one more time. Yeah, I need to put numbers. I realize this yeah, now. I've never done it in a group like this. Usually I'm in an audience and I can point. Uh, so do you see my cursor there, Wendy? Yeah, that's the one. I think yeah. that's what everybody chose though, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure because I got, I guess we got confused with left and right there. I think that's the one that people like, I don't know if like isn't the right word, but thought had more wholeness. I think that's. Which one, I guess we go back to the question. If you had to choose one of these two carpets as a picture of yourself, a picture of your true nature, which would you choose? The left. We have to decide, you've got to tell us which one, like have carpet A and carpet B. Give them a... I know. Uh, okay, because so, I cannot oh, see everyone. Uh, aren't you talking the about the Berlin prayer rug and then the yes. Anatolia one? So yes. the bright reddish vermilion one and black, isn't that the Berlin? Prayer rug. But, I, but they may be reversed on your screen, I realize, from my screen. Yeah. So do you see my cursor moving? Yes. That's the Berlin prayer rug. That's oh, our left. So that's, that's, on, that's on your left, Roger? Yeah, that's okay. So that, or your left. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the one that Chris Alexander points to, and for for me, I see it, but I have to be, I have to start pointing out the differences, and and unfortunately, I've sort of gone on over my time. So, uh, but the next next week, the plan is to start to talk about all the reasons for that, why why this why this carpet uh, has more wholeness, and it, hopefully, it'll become as apparent uh, to you, uh, if not already. Uh, from hearing the, the reasons and seeing seeing it, but not to say this right isn't beautiful and isn't kind of amazing. It's a lot of great qualities. It's not about that. It's not really about preference. It's really about something else. 
And so my job now for the week is to think of ways to convey what that difference is and what it is I'm actually trying to point to for you. So, uh, so I'll, I'm going to think more about uh, what is What is the more geometrical one called? That's the... Uh, da, 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 Kazakh star. Well, and Kazakh? I'll tell you what... I, what? It's from Kazakhstan. Oh, with a K. Yeah, Kazakh from Kazakh, the Kazakh star. That's from the mid 19th century. The Berlin prayer rug is from the second century, central Anatolia. And what I'll do is I'll put that picture when I put up the class video tomorrow, I'll put up, uh, I'll put up that picture so you can see it really well. I'll put up that uh, slide so you can see that really well and look at it. Uh, and so I want to I want to figure out the ways to, uh, like I say, uh, if we evaluate it in the way that we usually look at an artwork, like what's pleasing, what's symmetrical, we like the colors, we like the shapes like that. Uh, uh, it it's it's more of an even division usually. Like some people have preference in some people for one, and some people have a preference to the other. Uh, but I need to uh, help point out what the wholeness aspect. That's what we're going to get into, and that's the key to start looking at. Uh, how Chris Alexander looks at architecture and patterns and presence in place, all based on this wholeness. This is what he's come to. Uh, and you're going to see the connections of that to some of the deeper parts of where you get in meditation when you're kind of looking at the connectedness of things. Uh, and so the, the, the question of uh, the question of asking which uh, carpet uh, is a picture of yourself really points you back to that same thing when you ask what makes a good drawing it's trying to point you back to that feeling and and mirror, see which carpet mirrors that the most which carpet mirrors back that uh that sense of of where that source is that creative source that that image of yourself and which is mirrored in the carpet but uh yeah if, if we don't get it the first night we'll get it because it takes time <laughs> i for sure took a long time i went through a lot of comparisons in this test thinking it was kind of kind of crazy so i forget what it's like the first couple of times you see it uh but uh you will get a sense for it and i'm going to go through all the properties which really helps and then we'll have a lot of design tools the other great thing that i got out of the 15 properties before i even really got the wholeness aspects uh was uh, that it really improved even my doodling, but it improved all of my drawing because if you start to apply these 15 properties even unconsciously in your work or you start to look for them even one or two properties at a time, yeah, you'll, you'll notice some shifts in the drawing. So it's, so it's going to enrich your drawing practice, I think, uh, on one hand, and then sort of on the long term, hopefully it'll bring you into this concept of wholeness. So you can just appreciate what it is. Like I say, it's, it's, it's nothing uh, that I'm kind of preaching or saying, you, you, you know, this is going to solve any problem, but for the same reasons we're interested in meditation, I think that, that d discovering this wholeness is a really great exercise uh, and we'll see where it goes. So I've gone way over tonight, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's a huge topic. I still had more. I would have more, uh, but I'm going to, yeah, and I forgot what it was really like the first time you get introduced to the wholeness, but I st we, start at the, we start with the whole picture and then we'll go and we'll break it down uh, over the next few weeks. So um, hopefully uh, you found that of interest and uh, I'm going to hang out, uh, yeah, for about 10 or 15 more minutes after class. Uh, I, I'm going to go to that other lecture eventually, but um, I'll be around if uh, after class if you have questions or want to discuss something. And again, if uh, you don't want to wait around, I'm easily uh, contactable during the week. So uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, John, thank you so Thanks much for much. doing this.